Hello, folks. This is Michael Broussard of Ask a Sex Abuse Survivor. Welcome to Survivor Stories. Uh, today, Krista Hayburn has uh, graciously agreed to tell her story and to take your questions. When you want to ask Krista a question, what you need to do is go down to the bottom of your Zoom window. You'll see something called Q&A. And uh, just click on that, type in your question, and we'll get to those as we proceed through the presentation. I want to say welcome, Krista. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, there's a lot we're going to get into today. Um, but I usually like to start by asking uh, you to tell us about the abuse you experienced in as much or as little detail as you are comfortable with. Sure. We have time, right? Because it seems like it's a long, it's going to take a little bit of time. But um, so, so my story, my journey begins in January of 2006. I was a Philadelphia police officer. I was recently, within the week before, asked by the inspector of that district, of the districts. Um, he was the commander of that, uh, um, of the East Task Force. He had asked me if I wanted to join his, um, the East Task Force. Well, I had just lost my partner. He had gone back to a five squad position. So it was just me. And I thought to myself, wow, this is pretty amazing to be given that opportunity to go into his task force. And hopefully as years go on in my career that I'll be able to move maybe into a special unit um, with my, you know, getting the, gaining the knowledge and working with the, um, with the inspector. Um, I had known him um before he was he he had recently come back to our to our district to be the commanding uh district of the east division um but i had known him prior when i was in the, what was the old building um but like i said he asked me if i wanted to and i jumped at the chance um no other reason to excuse the dogs <laughs> um to say no so it just so happened when I was coming up that week, he was actually getting ready to leave to go to the FBI Academy um, for training. So as many what police officers do, they go out to celebrate afterwards. So we were asked if we wanted to attend his going away party um, at a local bar that was literally around the corner from our district. So. I was kind of hemming and hauling, not sure if I really wanted to go because I honestly, I felt uncomfortable being the new person who was personally asked to come up to the task force. Mm. So I didn't have to interview or apply for this position. I was asked so that the idea behind it was I was afraid that people were going to have judgment around that because that's just what happens in the police department. If a woman's ask to to come up to you know join a team of you know great officers that she's probably doing something to get where she wants to go which wasn't the case I was a pretty great officer um that being said uh, I decided to go over and you know kind of it was just hanging out and chatting with the new people getting to know them we were drinking um, and then there was a there was a point in the night where he was sitting at the bar with the uh, captain of the East Detectives, and they were kind of going back and forth about I don't know making comments about me and another officer who was very built just like me, short, very petite, brown hair, pretty. Um, about the two of us and the. Vector grabbed me around my waist, kind of pulled me in and was like, you know, you know, are you much more funner than than Chrissy? And I was like, I'm a blast, kind of joking, because I was a little taken back, one, that he kind of put his arm around me. Um, but then, you know, I kind of went and I did my thing again, chatting and whatnot. Um, so I ended up getting a phone call from a friend of mine. And I decided to take it outside because it was pretty loud inside. And as I was talking to him, um, the inspector comes out and was like, I want to talk to you. 
So I said, hey, I got to go. The inspector's here. He wants to chat with me. I'll give you a call back. So he takes my hand, walks across the street. And now to paint the picture of what the street looks like, there's no houses. Mm -hmm. It is the one side is um, a like electrical facility where they have like the the grids, right? Like the the, the big boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was very industrial and it was dark. Um, his his car was across the street. Pulled over, you know, pulled, walked me over, leaned up against it to get to my eye level because this man is about. I want to say he may be six, five, six, six, 300 and something pound African-American man who was once a football player, professional football player. Leans down and gets down and he mentions and says to me, hey, I always wished, I always knew that there was something between you and me. And I'm thinking to myself, who? That's not me. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. I was confused. And all of a sudden he comes in for a kiss and, and sticks his tongue in my throat. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, um, kiss back, um, because I was, it was not true for me. Um, so he stopped and, uh, you know, and I was like, and I kind of was like, after that, I was just like, what just happened? What just happened? And I'm like, it's really cold out. Again, it's January. Um, and I said to him, I was like, you know what? We better go back inside because people are going to start to think something. And I, I don't want to give the, the, them this impression. So we go back in. But as we're walking back in, he says to me, hey, don't let like when you leave, when you're getting ready to leave, let me know. And I'm like, what the F? <laughs> what? What? And I'm like. I walk into the bar and I'm, I literally do a, 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 like a 360 view, like my cop training pops back up and, and I'm looking for a way out. Like, how am I going to get out of this bar without him seeing me or having to go right past him? Because the bar was literally by the door. So no matter what way I had to go out, it would be through the front door. Needless to say, there was no way out other than the front door. So what I did was I decided I went back into, I went into the bathroom. I ran to the bathroom. I went into a stall. I called my friend back and I let him know what had happened. And I'm like, what should I do? What do I do? How am I going to get out of here without him seeing me? And I called another friend. They weren't around. Uh, I called him back. And now he's a police officer too. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, well, he'll give me some good advice. Um, so there was a point and, and, and let me just l tell you this, this was, was, and when I'm in the bathroom, it was like going into a time capsule and I just stopped. So I don't know what time it was. I don't know from when time, what time I went in there to the time I went out. I didn't, I, time did not exist. Mm -hmm. So I go, I'm standing by the door, the, the bathroom door is right behind me and there's the sink and a mirror and I'm on the phone and he pops his head in and he's like, hey, don't forget, let me know when you're leaving. And I'm like, did you just hear that? Did you just hear that? He asked me not to tell, I mean, he asked me to tell him when I was going to leave. What am I going to do? I'm like, I got to get out of here. Like, I got to go home. So I was like, all right, well, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to stay on the phone with you and I'm going to walk out, grab my purse and my jacket that was out there because I didn't take any of that in there with me and hopefully he won't see me. So we come up with this plan and I go to open the door and it felt like everybody left, like it was just me. And <laughs> I don't remember seeing anybody. So I'm like, all right, I have these blinders on and I'm just like, I just got to get past the door. I'm going to grab my stuff real quick. I didn't even know if he was around in the area, in the general area. I don't, I didn't even know. So I rush out, grab my jacket, grab my purse and head to the car. I'm putting the key in the car door and he comes running out from behind me and he's calling me and telling me to stop. And now I'm sitting in my car with the key into the ignition, 
on the phone and I'm like, and I told my friend, like, he's here, he's here. And I'm like, listen, I am telling him as he's up at the front door, because I'm up at my passing, my driver's side door, because now he's telling me, no, don't go, don't go, you know, stay for a little bit. And I'm like, no, I got to go. My husband's waiting for me. Like, it's time for me to go home. He's like, no, no. And he like takes my hand where the keys were, guides me out of the door and walks over to his police issued vehicle, opens the, the passenger side door and kind of guides me into the um passenger seat he comes in and shuts the door and then i go on to say this is not right well, i gotta go my husband's waiting for me and and just kind of reiterating this over and over again to let him know like i don't want nothing to happen like this i said this can't happen i just met your wife and your newborn born daughter i have to go and he's like, no, no, can't you just stay? Can't you just stay and, you know, um, whatever. And then he makes this statement, like, how do you think Jackie got her job, which was his secretary? And I'm like, are you effing kidding me? Like, I didn't sign up for this. And I didn't know that this was a prerequisite because I would have said no. Thank you. <laughs> um, and... That was when the rest of my night and the rest of my life changed. He assaulted me, did digitally penetrated me from the rear of my pants. I did everything that I could do to, to try to move my body in a way where he would stop or remove his hand. Um, he attempted to pull me over to get on top of him to have sex because he's like, you know, I got to get some because I got, I'm leaving for a little bit. And I'm just like, can't, he's like, can't you just help me out? And he's like, he pulls his penis out, puts my hand on and starts to go, move it in a jerking motion. And I'm just like, well, I, you know what? I gave up. I froze and I was like, I have to do this so if because there's no other way he's going to let me leave. So as he's doing this, he then tries to push my head down to make me give him oral. And I said, absolutely not. No. So now my head's down there, but my hand is, you know, jerking him off and he finishes. I gather myself up. He grabs my phone, puts his phone number in his in my cell phone and um you know tells me hey we should you should come down and visit me down in virginia while i'm down at the fbi academy and i'm like no i didn't say anything but then i left and i got in my car i drove i don't even remember where i drove because at one point the friend that i was talking to told me i was all the way over by the river and then i ended up over by the boulevard at some point. So I don't, I, I can't even tell you like, but I remember driving around the corner as fast as I could and pulling over because I couldn't stop crying. Like I was so, I, I couldn't believe just what happened. I was in a state of shock. And then I had to go home and tell my husband, which was the worst part. How so, did your, your husband react when you told him about what happened? He asked me what I wanted to do. He gave me the option and I just said nothing. I can't do anything. Do you understand how powerful this man is? He's like best friends with the commissioner at the time. They were, you know, they're out partying together and, you know, hanging out. They're bros. I can't go and tell on this guy. Do you know, that would, that would be the end of my career. The end of my career. So I got a shower and I was in bed for the next couple of days because I was off and I was, I felt ruined. So I had to go back to work and that's what I did. I don't know how I got up every single day, um, but I did. Um, and thankfully, I want to say maybe two weeks later, or so. No, actually, it was a little bit later than that. Um, I was decertified with 33 other officers for some reason. So they took my my police issued via, my police issued a firearm, 
and they decertified me. So that meant that I had to go back to the academy and do the entire academy in like three months. But that was a saving grace because I was out of the district. He I didn't have to see him. Mm-hmm. So it was perfect. I could breathe. I could be normal or what was normal. Um, and so I went there and uh, then I had to come back. And what I found that coming back, I would have to, because fu- we would come in, we would meet together every day to go over what we were going to be planning on doing in the district and our sectors and what we were looking for and so forth. And um, I was in the same room and all I wanted to do was like run away and um, got out of there as fast as I could, did my best not to engage with him or talk to him. Um, But then I noticed what he was doing was he was stalking me from outside, waiting for me to come into work every day and calling me like being like hey like calling me over from the 25th district side when i'm trying to go into the 24th district side to be able to kind of not cross paths uh to get into the locker room um but he always managed to wait for me every day um so that was that and then thankfully i was injured um after having a fight with a drug dealer uh, over a a uh, bunch of crack in his mouth. Um, I had gotten injured in September. So I was put on, uh, I was put on, you know, no duty because of my injury, which again was, you know, now here I'm dealing with a sexual assault and having to go to therapy on top of now I'm dealing with the pain of, an, of a nerve injury and going through those motions. So now I'm put on workman's comp and so forth. And and uh, yeah, um, then two years later, during my journey of my medical side of things, um, I had gone to a physiatrist who had said to me, he's like, Krista, you're never going to be a cop again. Like, there's no way you can be a cop. So I took that as my, my okay. I can never go back. So they're going to start working on like my 32, which is a disability from the police department. Um, I decided to go home and talk to my husband about reporting this. And because for me growing up, like being a victim all like for a long time was never a good feeling. So I needed to do something to be able to get out of that state of mind and overcome the adversity that I'm dealing with in some way, shape or form. And I Mm -hmm. felt that if I went to report it, that that would start the healing process. So I decided to write it out and figure I would just go to drop it off at internal affairs. Needless to say, that was not the case. And they questioned me and they questioned me. They asked me what I was wearing, you know, all of those victim blaming questions. Um, Mm -hmm. And it was another Mm -hmm. re-traumatization, needless to say. Um, And that's Mm -hmm. literally right after that. It was when they started to investigate me and put surveillance on me for my workers comp Mm -hmm. and started to retaliate. And that was a good, um, that was in 2008, that lasted until 2013 when I fired my, my, uh, when I fired my attorney because I had read the internal affairs um, reports by other cops when they were, you know, doing the, you know, the investigation and um the, again, more victim blaming. I'm a whore. I screw my partners. I screw the the uh, sergeants, and I, you know, had this. You know, I was just. They took me down, and I said, I, I'm not, I wasn't strong enough to go stand up. I had to, done so much inner work at that point that I was like, I can't do this again. If they, if I go back and do this again, I'm going backwards. So I was like, listen, we got to, we got to end all of this litigation. I can't deal with it. I don't care. You know, my, my mental health is much more important 
than, than this. And that was that. And that was that. It is. Oh, I forgot to mention oh. 2012 because mm -hmm. they did, they did send me back to work and they, they made me go back to work and write with my non-dominant hand um, that I had, I had re-injured while I was at work. They never did the paperwork and lied and said that I never went to them and complained about it. So they made me go through the steps of, they told me I had basically had to go back to work full, full duty or I had to go out on a medical leave, which would deem that, they, that my injuries weren't their fault. Um, so I told them that I would run my time and um, I, would, I would leave. But what I found out going through all that information um, that they ended up they wrote in my file that they fired me. Yeah. I don't know how they got me. Uh, um, yeah. There's so much there. There's so much. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm little by little, I have, I have various questions. Um, the first is, um, how did it change for you when, when you were first, coming into police work mm -hmm. versus after this experience, how did that attitude about the work that you wanted to do and the work that you did, how did that change for you? So I loved what I did. I loved working. I loved what I did and I was really good at it. And a little caveat was I worked in the district where my dad who was a heroin addict would go and take me to buy heroin. So I felt that I was doing something good for the younger mm. me. Um, so it took some time to, to undo the identity that I once was into the new identity that I would become. And I hope I'm answering that question um it changed it changed my perception of the police department in such a negative way um that i wanted to i wanted to share my story in hopes that something would change for other people because i knew that there were going to be if i was if i was a, a victim i knew that there mm -hmm. were other victims like me i knew that i wasn't his only victim and I'm not just talking about him, but I ultimately found out that the inspector who was in charge of internal affairs at the time that I came in was sexually assaulting his secretary. So it was a, it was a, an entire, you know, it was an issue within the entire department and nobody looked to deal with it or held people accountable especially those in power and for me it was like okay i'm gonna make somebody hear something and thankfully i was given that opportunity by a by a journalist from the philadelphia daily news back in 2013 and they printed my entire story because i remember going into work having to go into work and people knowing me and like imagine like the like what people were saying because they knew who i was they knew mm -hmm. what happened and then it wasn't until I had to go through the entire story to tell them what happened that they understood and that I wasn't lying. So, you know, and here I get this opportunity to share my story in one of the, you know, cops are reading that publication every day mm -hmm. down at court, you know. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. And uh, that kind of started my, my healing journey was telling my story. And sharing it. Um, do you feel? You know, you said you you this article appears in the in the Inquirer, and yeah. it's your story. And people who know you are now reading it who didn't know. Um, yeah. Was there a variance of people's reaction? Were some people supportive, some people non-supportive? I mean, how did that go for you? I never had anybody tell me that they didn't support me. Now, granted, the people who were in those records of my 
an internal affairs investigation did not support me. The people who reached out to me, cops and alike, were like, we knew like there was an issue with him. Like there, so we believe you. I never had anybody turn their turn and say to me, you're a liar at all. That's fantastic. That is yeah. rare and it's, uh, it's that's fantastic. Um, yeah. What I find interesting is what you just said that, you know, people react and go, well, we knew there was a problem with him. Um, how do you feel about people in a culture knowing like the culture you were in, knowing there's a problem with somebody, but years go by and nobody does anything about it? I mean, how would you, you know, how do you think that should be different? I think that, um, well, I mean, as time went on, I mean, we saw a, a shift in that, right? Uh, especially with in 2018 with Me Too and so forth. But back mm -hmm. then, it was a man's world and we just lived in it and we just worked in it and we didn't matter. So there was that whole sexism, you know, uh, in this masculine uh, agency. Um, it was frustrating because nobody wanted to hold people of rank accountable so they could get away with everything and a lot of them did and a lot of them did and i think that just goes back to the start of how the the culture was created from rizzo right when he was you know you know like and and nothing changed nothing has changed at least that i knew as i was going through this process mm -hmm. it, but i'm not i'm not originally from philadelphia i grew up in massachusetts and I moved here in the 1980s. And it always surprised me, continues to surprise me over the years, the way some people lionize Rizzo. Because Rizzo did a lot of terrible things. And Rizzo, would, and I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Rizzo was a thug. Rizzo oh. was a thug with a nightstick in his belt. Rizzo was a thug. Rizzo, he had cops out arresting men who were standing around on their own stoops yeah. at night because he assumed they were homosexual and therefore they needed to be arrested. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. So much over the years has not changed from that toxicity right. and things are starting to change, as you said, which is, which is good. Um, can we talk about your advocacy? Cause I know there was a point where you were out there telling your story and, you know, that's when you and I met and you did some, yeah. we did some events together and war has been incredibly War is uh, the Philadelphia Sex Center. Well, how do I say it again now? It's the Philadelphia Center of Sexual... Philadelphia Center Against Sexual Violence. Sexual Violence, yes. Because there used to be women organized against rape and now they're more right. inclusive, which right. totally understand why they were war women organized against rape because when right. all women feel attacked, they need somewhere to go. Right. Um, but I met you through war. Yes. And we did some stuff together and some events together. And then there's that gap where you couldn't do that stuff because your attention was on this situation in your life, this, this, this legal situation in your life. And now you've come back. What do you think is different between the advocacy you did before that and the way you told your story and the advocacy now and the way you tell your story? Um, well, that's interesting because not very many people know the reason why I stepped off the advocacy uh, stage of speaking um, was because I was involved in a criminal trial against my perpetrator. He was finally uh, going to be brought up. He brought, was brought up on charges for crimes mm -hmm. against me and two other victims. Um, so when they asked me to be a part of this, I didn't realize that they were going to basically take my voice away again. And what I found for me personally as being an advocate, that that what healing was, what looked like to me was sharing my story in a way of being able to create uncomfortable, having uncomfortable conversations, but it's ultimately making them comfortable so that people like you and I could be in a room, have this conversation about sexual violence in a way where people aren't cringing. And I think that's mm -hmm. probably how it has shifted even more now is because 
I regained my voice after being afraid of coming back out because I would they, I'd be looked at like some has been like, oh, where's she been for the past three years? <laughs> like what happened to her? She finally decided to curl out from a, under a rock like, you know, um, and unfortunately, during that time, I had to do a lot more healing um, that be able to create that more solid foundation to be able to hold that that space for um, survivors like us. Um, and, you know, yeah, I think that's kind of how it's shifted. Um, it is you wonderful know to have you back. It really it's is. one of those things I think I, what I, I realized was that instead of putting other people first, because that's what I always had done, I wanted to be that person who stood up for everybody. Mm -hmm. What I learned that I had to do was also stand up for myself and my what I needed. And I, that's where the shift happened this time around. But I can also be there for other people as well, but also taking myself into account too. I'm in a number of groups that are specifically for advocates like ourselves. And it is about that. It's about staying strong as an advocate, but also taking care of yourself and having the balance. And I think that is so important because a lot of us, we want to go out there we want to do positive work. We want to do good work. And for me, the initial rush was putting aside myself. And I didn't realize I was putting aside myself. And that can be, and that meant I would get to the end of roads where I was completely empty. Yeah. And I would just fall. And it's such an important thing you're saying that you've got to learn that balance between, mm -hmm. yes, you need to heal as well. Yeah. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I think there are times when I need to remove myself from the advocacy role for a little while and just be me and then go back to it. You know, right. I, I meter these things that I do. I, I space them out so I have time also to do other things that are important to me. Um, so you think you're finding a better balance with that now? Well, I mean, this is my first month back. <laughs> um, but I do feel... I do feel, yes, that that's kind of how, like you said, for, for yourself is to be able to balance it in a way where this isn't all that I do. Working at war until 2020 before the pandemic, it was a lot because I was also going through the grand jury investigation of my perpetrator. And on top of that, we have, you know, me too. We have the trial with, you know, the Supreme Court justice and um, Christine Blasey Ford. Like it was just so in a compact time frame mm -hmm. where it it shook me to the core that shattered anything that I had underneath of my feet where I had to rebuild again again and I feel that this time around I am a hundred percent better than where I was back in 2018. That's amazing I mean you're I've always thought you were very powerful um, from the first time I met you and that. to come back from all of that and do this again is just a credit to how dedicated you are to helping others and um it is truly appreciated by okay. so many of us um so i want to talk a little bit about healing specifically um yeah. first of all I, I do you do you do therapy have you done therapy um, I did therapy. So during my, um, my mental breakdown, I got a group of, I gained I, what I call like my, my, my team group. Um, and I found a therapist who was trauma, who worked with trauma in sexual violence. And I never had done that before. Um, I have done therapy over the years, but it was just talk therapy and so forth. Um, this time, this was it was different. Uh, she showed me different tools, which was great. Um, I have an amazing psychiatrist, um, and then I went and did some neurobiofeedback with another psychologist, which again was another opportunity to look at something different of how trauma affects the brain and how it affected me entirely um, up until that point to be able to work on that healing. Um, and then I enlisted shamans. 
which was prophetic and sped the process of healing up a lot faster than it had done ever before. Yeah. That's the thing that I think uh, a lot of people want to believe that there's a way to heal. And this is, this, and this is it. And it's right here. This is the way you heal. So right. they try to say to all other survivors, this is the way that you heal, but you're right. talking about different kinds of techniques that are complementary to one another about right. shamans, about, and you mentioned psychiatrists. So I'm assuming you mean medication. Yeah. Medication. Cause I also do that. And, uh, psychotherapy, trauma-informed therapy. Um, some people do very well in group settings, group therapy. Um, there's all different ways. And I think that that's so important for people to realize that there's not a wrong way. Right. There's your way right. and what speaks exactly. to you. Um, so I'm always interested to hear uh, because I myself am, you know, married to a non-survivor mm -hmm. and, you know, that has, a, that looks a certain way and, and is positive in wonderful ways. What is your relationship like with your husband when it comes to dealing with the, uh, with all of it, including, exactly. you know, needing to talk about things and, and, yeah. and therapy and whatever? How does that look for you? So my husband has always been my rock. I'm getting chills. <laughs> um, my family has always been my rocks. Like my little, my, my, my kids, they know my story. I don't hide anything from them because they need to know when I do go through those bouts that it's not them, it's me, and they don't take it personally. Um, and that I love them. And I think that's one of the things, even with my husband, is that, um, I had to let him know too that he wasn't able, he couldn't fix me. My husband's a medical professional and he immediately, well, what can I do to fix her? What can I do to help her? And, and ultimately what I said to him is to, for you to help me, I just need you for those times when I just need to talk that you'll just listen and you won't try and give me suggestions of what I should be doing um, because I know what I need to do. I don't need you to tell me what to do. Um, again, it's just, and what I always tell anybody who asks me, even as an advocate, what does a survivor want? They want to be heard. We just want to be heard and loved and not judged and just, you know, have compassion and empathy for where we are in those moments. And, and thankfully, he has done all of it. With being with me, with facing my perpetrator for the first time on that stand and, and walking off and breaking down because it was like this cathartic experience that I never experienced in my life, but I knew I had to because it was almost like this, this uh, exorcism. <laughs> that all this energy that was so built up in my DNA was coming out and he just held me just held me and you know he's understanding and thoughtful and you know I worry about him sometimes because he's been so incredible and so strong during these hard times that I know that there's times when he probably struggled too and it's sad because we don't talk about that we don't talk about them and they almost get pushed to the sideline like oh you'll be fine I mean this is what she's going through but it's that, 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 the, I mean, I'm dealing with a big T. That's a little T for him. You know, it might not be what he experienced, but he's experiencing it through me mm -hmm. because he loves me. That's something that comes up with Christy and I, and we've had to work at over the years. Trauma by association because yeah. you care about somebody. And we, you talked about this earlier. You're like, he can't fix everything. She can't fix everything. That was a gigantic discussion for us. Where I'm like, sometimes I just need you to be there and I, I don't expect you to fix it. And that is really hard for her when she looks at me and I'm going through a hellish thing and she can't fix it. Right. Um, but like, like you, I think just having someone like that in my life 
that strength, you know, and well, things may be temporarily really, really bad, maybe for days yeah. or a week or more. Right. One Years. of the reasons I can come out the other, right. One of the reasons I can come out of the other side of many of those things is because I know that she will always be there. I, I yes. think it's important to know, to be, to take the leap to talk to not just the person that, who is your significant other, but to friends yeah. as well, to people in your circle and give them the chance yeah. to be there for you and to understand. Um, what kind of strength do you draw from those outside relationships, from friendships? Um, do you talk to people as you're going through things about this? Yeah. And, and, and what, how does that feel for you? Um, unfortunately, I do not. I'm an internalizer. I like to, I don't want to ever feel like I'm burdening anybody. and but I've always been that way. I've always been somebody who took on what they were going through mm. alone, um, which helped me get through a lot of adversity over the years. Um, I, 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 I left it in the realm of going and talking to my therapist about stuff. I didn't want to give people outside of my sphere of comfort the I didn't want to drop that on them even though I know there's people like friends of mine who would be more than happy to listen and and I'm not saying that I didn't do that because I, I did when I was struggling and asked for help um, mm -hmm. I don't do it as often as maybe sometimes I should um, and yeah it's like I'd rather look up up, up on Google <laughs> To help me with my problem rather than giving it to somebody who, who you know like I don't, I don't want people to worry about me I mean I understand that I, I do understand that I um do you think there's any element of also self-protection by not talking to a lot of different people about what you're going through because that means maybe you wouldn't necessarily get a reaction that wouldn't be good for you um I think so um, I don't know because I haven't had that experience, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. As many times as I've talked to people about my story, people come with a, with the grace, with grace and compassion and understanding, and they're just shocked. Um, it's almost like a, you know, a lifetime movie where, you know, <laughs> you know, you go through all of this crazy stuff and then you come out on the other side and everybody's happy. Um, I like I said, I don't like to drop the trauma on other people. Mm. Mm. We talked a little bit before we started this interview today about a recent uh, talk you did for a National Guard audience. Yeah. Can you talk again about what that was like and 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 what you accomplished with that and how that experience was? Yeah, so I was I was. Um, accepted to speak at the Delaware National Guard in Delaware um, as one of their survivor, like give my survivor story during their training for leaders and commanders of units. Um, that was my first time ever speaking to a group of, you know, leaders. Um, and it was, it was, it was an event that I needed to do because I knew that I wanted to get in front of, of people in authority or leadership and so forth so that they're able to help people like me who were under, under supervision um, of that leadership if, and if that were to ever happen to them. Um, that I, I couldn't, I'll just say, I, as I was leaving, I walked out the door and there was this big African-American man on the phone. He gets off and he stops me and he's like, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. And I just want to tell you, I just got off the phone with my wife because she had come to me recently about feeling uncomfortable in her boss's office. And I needed to let her know that I'm there to support, support her in any way that she wants to do any 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 way that she wants and i attribute that to my husband because 
he was always there for me. He never turned his back on me, um, supporting me all the way, all the way. And here was this man saying he's going to be a better husband and a, and a, a more supporting husband. There could not be any more of a direct positive effect from what you're doing than that. My God. Yes. So not only am I sharing my story about this, but what my husband had gone through with me also helped in a different way. And it doesn't mm -hmm. always have to be about the violence that happens. It's about the effects of the of the family dynamic and mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Right. And the surrounding culture, like your work culture. And you know, yeah. or culture, you know, in the city you live in or whatever it is. There's so much, there's so many layers to it. And you gave that man the tools that he didn't have before to right. go and be a hundred percent more supportive of his partner. Um, right. That is amazing. And I just want to say that you are amazing. That is, that's Very beautiful. Absolutely you. beautiful. I appreciate that. Um, So, Previous to the experience and the assault, as a child, what was your experience like as a child? How do you think that impacted the way that you were as an adult? So I think growing up in an, in an addicted domestic violence situation, not feeling safe, not feeling like I could go to anybody, because I was also, and nobody knows this because I've never shared it publicly, was that at 14, year old, at 14 years old, I was dating somebody who was 21 years old who had sodomized me. And what I believed was I didn't realize what had happened to me until I went to my war training to be a advocate, a sexual violence advocate. I didn't realize that I was technically raped at 14. And that was sp supposedly my first time. So, um, so yeah, it's impacted me. Um, it's, it's happened twice. It will never mm. happen again. Um, but I think, yeah. Wow. I think also, growing up in the culture that I grew up in, it made me a better parent because I knew I did everything opposite of my mom and dad. My mom and dad never, you know, created a space, a safe space to be able to come and talk about this stuff. Um, it was always, you know, at, at, I think I was 12 and I got in trouble for a teacher sending me a letter asking me to send pictures of me in a bikini I never seen the what's name and I got in trouble and was grounded for two weeks. So what does that say? It, it says, this is not safe for you to come and talk to us. You're going to get in mm -hmm. trouble, which, yeah, is exactly to blame. Why I did, which is why I didn't report it in the first place to in the police department because mm -hmm. I'm going to get in trouble. So, yeah, I mean, those things, those things cut very, very deeply the way that you're raised, uh, the situation you're dealing with the fact that you needed help, the fact that you were accused when you were a victim, an obvious victim. Yeah. It, it always astounds me when parents do that, but they do. And it just, it, it, it sets a pattern that I think that we as survivors work hard to uh, change. And yes. you have done a lot of work in your life to change that pattern and including intensely Herculean efforts when it came to the situation you dealt with, uh, with the inspector, the situation you dealt with, with the criminal proceedings, right. um, coming back out now and planting your feet and saying, you know, this did not go the way I hoped it would go. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to make that a flag that right. I'm going to wave. And right. that is, to me, that is the mark of a truly heroic person. And I appreciate you. Be, I immensely appreciate you being out there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if someone came to you who you didn't know was a survivor and told you that they had just 
they'd never talked to anybody before about it. And you were the first person they were talking to about it. What would you say to that person? What do you want to know? What do you want to know? What can I, what can I, what can I do to help you understand this? What it would be like, you know, to talk to a survivor or what, how can we communicate about this? How can we communicate regarding sexual violence so that you're not uncomfortable? Because I'm not uncomfortable. We need to have a conversation where we talk about these uncomfortable things in a comfortable mm -hmm. area or space um, so that I feel safe to share right. uh, and be open and honest. Mm -hmm. We're coming up to the end of the hour. And before we finish up, I want to ask you if there's anything that you have not talked about yet that you would like to talk about. Anything I haven't talked about. I think I hit everything. I think I'm, I think I'm complete, Michael. You think that's fantastic. <laughs> Maybe, that's I wonderful. Think this might be complete. <laughs> you know, we are complete regardless of what other people yeah. think. You're absolutely right. It may look different, but that's okay. That's that is okay. all you need. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Well, I, I thank you so much for being so candid. I thank you so much for being so inspiring. And uh, I know this is going to help a lot of people. So I appreciate that. And I look forward to collaborating, the both of us, again, as we progress. Um, before we go, there's a few things I need to let everybody know. Um, we have a mailing list you can subscribe to at tinyletter.com slash ask a survivor, tinyletter.com slash ask a survivor. You subscribe to that mailing list, you will get notifications about these survivor stories events, about our survivor poetry readings, about uh, virtual plays that we do, about all the things that we do, as well as we do peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, support groups on Zoom, you'll get notifications about those as well. If you wanna contact us for any reason, you can email me specifically at askasurvivor at gmail.com, askasurvivor at gmail.com, and you will get me. If you're a survivor and you want to come and tell your story in one of these things, you let me know, and we'll get it together. If you're a survivor poet and you want to read your poetry online, let me know, and we'll get it together. Whatever it is that you need, you contact me, and I will respond. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you again to Krista. And I look forward to seeing everybody again at the next one.